could pan. And any barmaid could be a star maid if she dances with or without a man. Hooray for Hollywood! When you're terrific, if you're even good, where anyone at all from Shirley Temple to Amy Semple is equally understood. Go out and try your luck. You may be Donald Duck. Hooray for Hollywood! Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, the Rattle Broadcasting Network proudly brings to you Robert Winfrey, the host of Damn You Hollywood. And here he is, Mr. Robert Winfrey. Yay! You know what? I, I can't do this. Just stop the show. We're done. I'm not going to. I don't want to talk about this movie, Mark. I just, I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. I'm out. Don't be a pussy. <laughs> Uh, hi everyone. I'm Robert. Uh, this is Damn You Hollywood, and I'm more morose than usual, which is saying something tonight. Because we're talking about the movie no one asked for, no one wanted, and apparently no one enjoyed. But we'll still get a sequel based on pre-sales. It's Venom. <sighs> you know, I, I, I try again. I, I get that. I, my tastes run contrary to most people. I do. I'm okay with that. I get that I'm highly critical. I'm okay with that. I can live with it. It's how I am. And, you know, I try not to be overly angry and abusive of Mark because he works in a prison and he has two kids who in about five to ten years will be teenagers torturing him more than I ever did. And I I don't want to pile on him too much too, all, the, all that early, but Mark, I asked about this movie this is one of those few movies guys I might complain about the movies that we review because Mark sets the schedule and most of these are things I don't enjoy and that's fine I know what I signed up for I was not blindsided by this the schedule's been released and revised many many times and will be revised again three weeks out because studio executives like to make like to just make Mark's life difficult there's a handful that I say Mark please take this off the schedule they're very rare, but they happen. The only other movie this year that I recall saying, Mark, please don't make me do this. Please, please, I don't want to do this. Why are you hurting me? <laughs> Was A Wrinkle in Time. And Mark said, shut up and deal with it. So we shut up, and I shut up and saw it. And then after we got out of the movie, when we did the show, he apologized to me for making me do that. <laughs> Mark, I would like another apology from you as it pertains to this movie. I will not, because I took off. Uh, I took the schedule. I took off the schedule. Uh, Nutcracker in the Four Realms. I feel like that balances out the force. This does not. Not even close. <laughs> this was right. not as as bad as you're making. I mean, it might be bad for you. I don't. I don't look. I want to respect your absurdity um, in the way that you look at the world. That's fine. That's you, and I understand that. But this movie. It's not the Leonard Part 6 you're making it out to be, okay? Yes, it's a terrible movie. Yes. It, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, that, that's your defense. Like, no, okay, look, you're calling this like used toilet paper. And I'm saying, okay, it's used, but it was like a nose blow rather than an ass wipe. More, I, I, again, <laughs> it's, it was gutted like a fish. It, they they lost sight of what the initial pitch of the movie was, so it became a tonal mess. But somewhere in there, Tom Hardy fucks the scenery, okay? Midway through this movie, Tom Hardy doesn't just eat the scenery. He has sex with it. And we're not talking consensual sex here. He rapes the scenery, and then it cries in the corner and says, Hashtag me too. All right? And that alone is reason enough... To, to at least talk about this movie and have some fun. And here to have fun with, with this movie is a man who loves his symbiotes. And that is the official pronunciation for this fucking show. Okay? Symbiote. I, I cannot believe... We knew, we need, I, I need to talk about that stupidity just for a bit. We'll, like, we'll get there. We'll get there, Dorothy. I promise. But let, let us bring... Jason on. Let, let's bring on... Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen... Uh, I had to for, cut through it. Hush, Jeff. 
Um, ladies and gentlemen, that, our, now that wounds me deeply, Mark. <laughs> when you misbehave, you get spankings. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, for the third time, the host formerly of From the Cheap Seats, now a member of one of the football podcasts that I don't remember the name of, on on uh, WTM. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the great Jason Teasley. How do you do, sir? Hey, how you guys doing? It's good <laughs> to be back here on the Adelaide Broadcasting Network. Uh, otherwise known as asshole squabble like dicks. It's a good thing that yeah. it's this week that <laughs> Jason came back because he's done with the hangover from celebrating the Browns' first win in 18 years. Yeah. Um, well, it, it happens. <laughs> I, I, don't think, I, I don't think I could have done a show with Jesse with, with having the Browns actually win a game. But that's a whole different story. <laughs> oh, that would have been hilarious. Are you a Browns fan or not a Browns fan? I'm, I'm lost in the sauce here. <laughs> Jesse's a huge Browns fan. I'm I'm not too big of a Browns fan, but they won their second game this year. <clears throat> their first win came after 638 30 days. 30-some-odd days. It was the worst yeah. losing. The fact that they drew in their opening game with the Steelers was their best start to an official season in like a decade. Yeah, I think of their best start was a tie, and that was the best start since, like, 2004. Yep. <laughs> it, was the, right. it was the saddest statistic I'd ever seen. I laughed so hard. And for more of All this right. sort of thing, check out Jesse's Pigskin Pick uh, podcast here on the Rattle Legend Broadcasting Network. Jason, why don't you tell the people why you insisted on being on tonight's show, other than you wanted to get in between Rob, Robert and I as we get into a slissy slap fight? Well, honestly, I just miss you guys, and um, I haven't done a podcast with either one of you in over a year, and I thought, why not do Venom? Um, it, it spawns one of my favorite comic book characters of all time that we'll get into later. And, you know, if you're doing, if you're doing something on the symbiote, yes, I'm pronouncing it that way. I don't care what anybody says. Um, I... I feel that I just have to be a part of it because that's just who I am. Venom's one of your favorite characters, right? No, Carnage. Venom is not. Carnage is my favorite character of all time. Where does Venom rank I, uh, as opposed to Carnage? Eh, he's in my top ten. What were your... Uh, Mark, you have to understand. Carnage is to Jason what the Hulk is to you. Fair there enough. is only a distant second. Okay. Um... Before we before I hand the show back over to Robert so he can do his thing, what were your hopes and dreams for this movie? When they said, I mean, first of all, when did you learn that Sony was doing a Venom movie? And then once you learned of that fact, what, in your mind, what were you thinking was going to gonna be the Venom movie? Like, what were you hoping for? I was honestly hoping for uh, <laughs> not a shit show. Uh, <laughs> well, that... You said that it- that was a the reasonable way. bar, and they couldn't. <laughs> that, that 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 was that was not achieved. Um, we 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 will be talking about that. But I was really excited when they was doing Venom because Topher Grace as Venom kind of left a sour taste in everybody's mouth. And so did the whole Spider-Man Three movie. But I mean, it had some. Yeah, Topher Grace's Venom had some high points. It had the iconic bell toll and all that. But yeah, it was Topher Grace. I mean, but you know, Tom Hardy playing Venom, I was really excited about. It. I thought he could pull off Eddie Brock really well, and then I was proven wrong. <laughs> uh, That's a bit much. I mean, if there's anything decent about this movie, okay. it's Tom Hardy. Well, no, no, no. Like no. I said, Tom Hardy. He, he hang on, hang on. Let's be part. clear. Tom Hardy is great in this movie. He's just not playing Eddie Brock. Go on, Jason. Yeah. It's, Exactly. He, he, I mean, the bar was Topher Grace. I could play Venom better than Topher Grace. I mean... Yeah. I don't disagree. I, I, I mean, so the, 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 the bar for Eddie Brock was not set high. But I had the, the character of Eddie Brock, as, Tom Hardy as Eddie Brock, I, I was all aboard for it. And then I seen the movie. He did great, but he did not do Eddie Brock great. There was a lot of things that I had 
issues with with this movie that I'm sure that we'll dive into. But I I want to be sure to circle back to that because I have no relationship with the comic book character of Eddie Brock. I I just don't. So I'm curious <laughs> to see what what they changed. And after watching this movie, you still don't. <laughs> that that yeah, was Eddie I mean, Brock in name only. Okay. Yeah. Um, and the fact that I, I the spoiler got out. I mean, if anybody hasn't seen it, I'll go ahead and give you a five second spoiler alert. And they don't deserve okay, it. We we just spoil that, crap here. Everybody yeah, knows what so, they're in for. So and then I hear the the announcement that Carnage is going to be in the the post credit scenes. Really excited. Then I kept hearing the rumors of who was playing Carnage, and I was like, no, they're not going to get him to play Carnage. That would be ridiculous. That makes no sense. You want somebody that can, you know, grow with the character, not grow old as the character. Um, we want we want Carnage, you know, being able to fly, uh, web around New York, not be pushed around in a, in a wheelchair or on a rascal. So... <laughs> So I was really that 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 broke my heart. Who the, and then I got the visualization, and I'm sure we talked off air about it, and I, we're going to definitely talk on air about it. You, <laughs> I, you I, I, just I was, you uh, your relationship with Woody Harrelson, man. I like Woody Harrelson. I, I like Woody Harrelson when he was in Natural Born Killers. That would be the carnage that I'm I, I liked, not this. 80-year-old Woody Harrelson. <laughs> Woody Harrelson is not... Eight. Hang on, just for the sake of... Okay, he's 65. Woody Harrelson is 57, all right? Okay, you got a 60-year-old man playing Carney. He's not even, he's not even 60. And in by fairness, he doesn't... They, by the time he they looks much they, younger by, than by the time they follow up to the movie and it gets green lit and they actually make he's going to be 60 he's not yeah, wrong true. Robert how old is Woody Harrelson again he's 57 okay so okay, hang on no no hang on for fair. a second let me do movie math here he's 57 it's um so in three years he's 60 right so yep. right now the next movie in production is Morbius so we're talking two more years for uh for Morbius to get released Right around the same time, they'll probably start working on Venom Two: Maximum Carnage, which means he will be sixty-one, sixty-two by the time it airs in theaters. He's he's going to be collecting the ARP. That's <laughs> it's fifty-five. All right, all right. Let's turn the show back over Please to Robert check here. Your benefits package, so that we can, yeah. uh, so that yeah, he can get into the what they call a plot of this movie. Lots of luck, pal. There's a plot. There's not a plot to this movie. <laughs> no, there was not. Like, oh god. All right. I'm gonna try to limit my overt criticisms of this until I get done with the synopsis. So, in the interest Mark, of time and because we have a guest, you have one rabbit hole, and that's it. You editorialize okay. beyond that. I'm gonna stop you. I'm gonna okay. give you an additional two because I. It's two against one, Mark. It's not your fucking and podcast. I like I, I like I like I like Robert's editorials because <laughs> they actually provide insight sometimes. Not while he's doing uh, a plot occasion. synopsis. I'd like to actually get to the movie <laughs> review before I turn sixty-five. Go. <laughs> so you want to go back in time? Oh, fuck off! <laughs> <laughs> All right. This movie starts with space because that's where symbiotes come from. Uh, a space shuttle mission of some variety never properly d explained but they were in space wrong funded they, by they did explain it the space shuttle was searching for uh, other habitable worlds because this one was getting uh, set fire by global warming it was I'm, said in the movie I'm, and I'm going to wildly complain about that by the way okay <laughs> but but at least get it right move on okay so they uh, this spaceship is returning, and they have something on the spaceship that breaks in when they're in the middle of re-entry and causes a horrible crash. This particular space program ship thingy expedition is funded by evil ethnic version of Elon Musk, whose name I can't remember. <laughs> Carlton Drake. Generic villain name. Hard set. We want hard consonants. 
That makes you a villain. Uh, who is, I mean, I joke about just evil ethnic Elon Musk, but that's that's like what they wrote as a descriptor for the character, and then nobody actually fleshed it out. That's all it yeah, is. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that if you looked up the character description, it says evil Elon Musk. Must be, a, <laughs> must be ethnic. Ethnicity optional. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, but they have brought back these alien life forms that can't really survive in our atmosphere, but can survive via bonding. They're these kind of goopy masses that form that you know, form uh, symbiotic relationships with their with hosts. In theory, they're symbiotic relationships. It's like no one who wrote this thing understands basic biology about the different types of relationships between organisms. And in this instance. Carlton Drake is just obsessed with space, human evolution. The destruction—it's—it's it's a bit nebulous. He's crazy. That—that's kind of the nuts and bolts of it. And wants to find a way to bond symbiotes with humanity. And because he is an ethical wasteland, he starts doing this with people relatively quickly. Now, the two other major points to take away from the opening bit of the movie, despite it being interminably long is that one of the symbiotes breaks free of its containment after the crash and begins sort of killing its way through parts of the world. It, I mean, it's such a... That whole, like, Riot's wacky adventures <laughs> was was just so stupid. But. Am I the only one that I'll needs bet. to... S- Am I the only one that needs to see Riot's, like, own, like, little movie where he's the where he's this little Asian woman? Uh, I yeah. Would be, uh, that w- Oh, and it was all based on seeing a patch. No, no, no context. He sees a patch, and he knows where to go. Yeah, uh, I'm. I'm gonna get to that because that was so, so stupid. <laughs> anyway, so that particular symbiote is now moving his way sort of across the world. Uh, we also are introduced to Tom Hardy's terrible, terrible sort of New York accent. I love Tom Hardy, but. Good God, that accent. And his version of Eddie Brock, who is an investigative reporter living in San Francisco now after having been run out of New York City for nebulous reasons. I mean, I imagine it was just, hey, don't, aren't you supposed to look like Topher Grace? And he just couldn't take it anymore. <laughs> yeah, it's like, hey, we have Topher. Topher Grace is, is your gold standard. And it was like... Let's can't stay in New York with that. I'm getting as <laughs> far hold, away from you as I can. Hold my beer. <laughs> uh, anyway, we he is in he has a successful investigative journalism program on a network. Never which one is specified, but the network, much like the studio. Uh, and he's pitched a softball interview with Carlton Drake. He's supposed to ask him nice publicity questions because Carlton Drake is rich, famous, and crazy and could buy and sell the totality of this presumably multi-million dollar network, likely publicly traded but no, he can totally just buy it with his pocket change because he's just that powerful and again, he was supposed to play nice but being a moron, he can't play nice he breaks into his fiance's laptop because her firm does business with the foundation that he runs. Finds evidence of some of his wrongdoing, and because he can't help himself during this interview, asks questions about wrongful death lawsuits and ethical quandaries and violations that have come up, and Carlton Drake just cuts the interview short, ruins the man's life a little bit. I mean, it's never made clear how much of what happens was... Drake's fault, how much of it was just the actual consequence of the violations of proper journalistic procedure that Eddie Brock himself (laughs) did, but we then flash forward six months. For some reason, Riot has not actually left Southeast Asia, despite in a bit getting on a plane and landing in San Francisco in a few hours. Uh, Eddie Brock is living in a crappy apartment after his fiance dumped him and moved on with a surgeon. He's stuck living across from a heavy metal rocker. His life sucks. But he is contacted by one of the scientists from the Life Foundation who 
despite presumably having gone through multiple other variations of human trials that resulted in people dying across other scientific en endeavors, this one, for some reason, is the, the bridge too far for this character. She contacts Eddie Brock because... Yeah, th this is one of the big holes in the story for me. Like, if you legitimately have proof, you don't go to a quiet investigative journalist. You actually just spread it as far as you possibly can to try and take down someone of that much power. You don't, you don't sit on it. You don't go small. You go big. If you have, if you legitimately have proof, and she does. But countermanding logic, the scientist goes to Eddie Brock and brings him into the facility to get more proof other than what she already has at least to corroborate her story something along those lines while there Eddie Brock is attacked by one of the symbiotes this one reveals itself to be Venom can I just say that like I, I know the Venom symbiote says at one point on my planet I'm kind of a loser do you think that's because he's the only one who wasn't named after an adjective I mean, you got the others. It's like, hey, I'm Riot. Carnage, my man. Hey, Havoc, how you doing? Who's this guy? Pfft, Venom. And everyone just laughs at his name because it's a noun instead of a... It's bad <laughs> enough that somebody wrote that line into the movie. Now you're doing a, you're doing a stand-up bit on it. Just keep <laughs> yeah. keep doing the plot synopsis, you hack. Uh, sorry. Yeah, I, I, I had to get that out of the way. Did you? Yes. Otherwise, it would have come out later. You're better off that I got it out of my system. Okay. Anyway, so one of the things about the ho about you know the lack of cohesion between symbiote and host is that they have to have a perfect match, which is never actually <coughs> explained. But the rough metaphor they come up with is you know organ transplants. They have to be enough points of commonality to form a proper bond, and we're essentially just. We have no way of actually predicting this. We're just throwing different people in front of these things and seeing if it happens to work. Uh, in the case of Eddie, it does seem to be more or less perfect. And the symbiote begins to make itself known. Tom Hardy eats chicken out of a garbage can because Venom is always hungry. Uh, the uh, scientist in question gives up Eddie Brock because Carlton Drake appeals to her sense of reason as well as simultaneously threatening her family, which, to be fair, is a really good way to go about that. Then she dies, and then the symbiote that had possessed her dies. Like, they start with four of these things and just through bad laboratory procedures lose <laughs> two. Two of them die, and one of them escapes. Like, <laughs> this is just not a well-run scientific institution here. There are not proper procedures in place. Uh, this is not the Life Foundation. This is the Oopsie Foundation. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, she gives him up. There's a car chase through parts of San Francisco. The Venom symbiote takes over Tom Hardy's body. He kills one guy sort of in a darkened alley off screen almost. Uh, he confronts a SWAT team later. He tries to he tries to get his evidence out to a media member but this particular plot point doesn't actually go anywhere it turns out the symbiote might be killing him but that's never actually explained further either because this thing was destroyed in the editing room uh, he is forcibly debonded with it because sound waves in a certain frequency are potentially fatal to these creatures as is fire which is I mean, hey which which is a um how it runs in the comic book too. Sound and fire are its uh, kryptonite. I just have to bring out how how phenomenally stupid it is for a theoretically higher form of life like this to be allergic to combustion. <laughs> I mean, it's not good for us. It's not good for us, mind you. But like, if this thing's evolved to that point, it's like, boy, I, you know, these sound waves. They like mess with Hang molecular on. In, in this fairness is not a good to thing. in fairness to it, it is made of matter. Matter burns. I think true. I, I think the emphasis on fire, like nothing else can hurt this thing except for fire. And it's like, well, wait a minute. Fire destroys most things. That's fair. The real kryptonite is sound is the sound waves above six thousand megahertz, I think it was. It was it was a specific range. Like yeah. Two yeah, it was like four it was like four to six. Four to six, yeah. I mean, and look, I'm okay with extreme 
heat or extreme cold being lethal to it, that's fine. Like, sure. I mean, that makes that that makes sense logically, even though these things apparently exist in the vacuum of space. So extreme cold is kind of off the table. Well, no, it said it, it, it existed on another planet. So the whole thing with the symbiote, just as just to brief you on this, what's said in the movie and implied in different areas and, and written underneath a rock and on someone's ass as a tattoo is essentially these things come from another planet. And they're like the, xenomo- the xenomorphs um, from the alien movies. They just sort of exist. Oh, they just sort of exist to go from one planet to another um, and d- just tearing it down and destroying everything in its path, e- eating up all its... Re- better Better th- one here would be the aliens from Independence Day. Um, I was waiting for you to get there. So, you know, planet to planet, they th- they just munch up all the resources and people and then move on, and then leave a husk in its wake, move on to the next thing. Um, that's essentially what Riot's plan was. Uh, th- for whatever the reasons are, um, the... Our planet, mostly good. Problem is the oxygen. The only way they can live is through bonding with humans. But the point would be they would take the humans over, you know, suck up all the resources, kill what's left of the humans, move on to another planet. That was, the, that was Riot's plan. You know you just created two, two more movies, Symbiotes versus Aliens and Symbiotes versus Predator, right? <laughs> Symbiotes, Independence Day. Yeah. Uh, anyway, oh, God. Hollywood. Uh, so, I hope Hollywood. I hope you're listening. Do I not hope listen. To, do I not hope you're listen. Not. <laughs> do not listen to these ideas. These are these are the worst. <laughs> uh, anyway, after Tom Hardy has been Tom Hardy is forcibly separated from the symbiote. About the same time, the Riot symbiote actually arrives in San Francisco and bonds with Carlton Drake. Seemingly without issue. I mean, he might have just stumbled into another near-perfect host, all things considered. I mean, uh, I, I, have have so many pro- I have so many it's problems. straining yes. credulity. But Eddie Brock is then captured by their men because he was the last one seen with the symbiote. He doesn't have it anymore. So they decide to kill him, but not in their isolated lockdown sterile laboratory but actually literally walk him out into the woods to shoot him well it wasn't a lockdown either because there's something when we get when we get further in I want to talk about this lab <laughs> the lab is just the worst like, because a multi-million dollar lab that has cameras nowhere <laughs> bother that's very yes. fair Pat Mullen has more cameras in his apartment than this lab does yeah. Um, anyway, as they are trying to... True story, by the way. Have you listened to the Bill Cosby podcast? No, not yet. Well, that's why you didn't get that joke. Okay. As they're about to kill Tom Hardy, his fiance, who's kind of been back in the picture, not romantically, but because she's the... I mean, you'd think in six months he would have at least made one other friend that he could go to in times of crises, but no. He did, the homeless lady. And you can't go to the homeless in times of crisis. Yeah, because she became Venom. And then she died, yeah. But she, she Venom, shows up for a few seconds. Uh, the symbiote returns to Venom. It then... Something about this process has turned it from murderous into altruistic. <laughs> like, <laughs> for no reason. Literally no reason. He decides, now I'm going to be a good guy. I'm going to uh, spend so long talking about that because it's so bad. Yeah. Yeah, we'll get to that. Uh, So he and... So again, Tom Hardy as... So Eddie Brock and the symbiote uh, Venom decide they have to stop Riot from launching himself back into space to get more reinforcements and bring them back in what I have to assume would be a generational long space flight. But they decide they have to stop him. There's a fight terrible terrible graphics like just, this was the worst thing in the world to try and follow visually and that includes a couple of Transformers action sequences it was just bad but in the end they persevere they fake that the Venom symbiote died but it didn't really because sequels and Eddie Brock and the symbiote come to a conclusion that if you're going to stick around you can only hurt bad people and because he likes eating 
a lot, including living things, specifically people, he decides that people who do bad things he will eat. And Eddie Brock, despite being a human with higher brain functionality and presumably a decent moral compass, decides to go along with this. It was actually Eddie Brock's idea. Uh, yeah, and at the end, they eat a random thug off the street because they wanted to make a pun afterwards. Well, he had he had established himself earlier as trying to get protection money out of the nice Asian lady. I know, and I'm again. It, it's just like one more stupid thing that this movie does. <laughs> that nobody has any connection to this lady other than Eddie goes there and gets sandwiches. Uh, yeah, despite... Never mind, I'll, I'll talk about the ennui that develops in centralized urban areas if we really feel then compelled to go into the psychology of it. We don't. And then, and then to close out the movie, Eddie Brock goes to an interview with notorious serial killer Raggedy Andy. I mean... <laughs> Here we go. Carrot top. I mean, I'm, look, I love Woody... I love Woody... Harrelson, I think he would actually do a decent job as Cletus Cassidy. Again, it, he's done crazy roles like that in the past. The wig they put on him for this <laughs> was so bad. And then he does what every you know, comic book movie like this has to do, and that's you know, say the line about his own character's name in the upcoming thing. Um, there will be carnage. And- and for some reason, that was slightly less painful than the Eminem song they had playing over the credits leading up to that scene. Oh, uh, there was the um, Eminem song over the over. I'm All pretty right. sure. I All feel right. I feel pretty confident in saying that. I don't um, didn't even notice. Uh, I was so done with the movie by the end. <laughs> okay, where do we want to start with this monstrosity? Because yeesh. All right, you know what I. I want to. I'm going to say a couple of things, but I'm going to make the. Since it's more than two of us tonight, I'm actually going to make my comments brief because you know Jason is very passionate about this about this character, about this intellectual property, and he's our guest, so I want to give him time. God so, damn it to hell! Did your car? Sorry, Dustin, did your car no, just transform no. into a robot? Oh fuck! Dustin Poirier's injured and Dustin out of a fight. Dustin Poirier's out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Best fight on that I- card. Fell apart. I anyway. feel that that would probably be a better discussion than us talking about Venom. No, 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 no. People actually uh, we, tune into these video, these reviews actually here's review movies. So we got okay, that out of the yeah. way. In the <laughs> Jesse, we will t- Jesse, you and Pat can listen while we can talk about the movie. There, there's the two people that's probably tuning in. No, I have numbers it's that prove it's 10. otherwise. Twenty. It's Twenty. <laughs> Thank you very much. Twenty, dude. <laughs> our big shows might do twenty. Like my U, the UFC two twenty nine preview and review did twenty and, and change. Like, so all, all, all I'm going to say is I don't know if it still stands, but I do hold one of the highest number of viewers with Melissa Radledge for a podcast ever on the Radledge Broadcasting on a, Network on a different host, that's which true. doesn't count anymore. Anyway, oh wait, uh, wait. So we're just ignore. Uh, all right, all right. If that's the line you want to draw, Mark, we can yeah. do that. That that's BC. Okay. This is AD. Let's move on. Let me make my okay. <laughs> let me make a few, let me make a few comments here, and then I'm going to turn it over to Jason. Graciously turn it over to Jason, who's slowly but surely trying my patience. Um, now listen, <laughs> this, this this movie there is three. There's three parts to this movie, right? The beginning, which is god awful boring. Okay, so there's no characters in this thing. It's all either caricatures or people just reacting to things. Um, there's no actual characterization other than, you know, bad guy wants to do bad things at the cost of everyone around him. And the Eddie Brock character is not even a good guy. He's just reacting. So there's that. Anyway, the, the whole beginning is so interminably boring. It's, I have fallen asleep on a lot of movies this year. It's amazing I was awake through this whole thing. And that's, I think, because I sat, I almost stood up to keep myself awake. Plus the couple next to me, which as an aside, if you are going to the theaters, people, listen to the sound of my voice. If you are going to the theaters in 2018, shut the fuck up. Stop talking through the movie. This isn't football. You're not John Madden. I don't need to hear you narrate assholes. Um, so anyway, after I got up and changed my seat... <laughs> 
I, uh, I, you know, I, I did everything I could to keep myself awake because getting to the point where Tom Hardy actually becomes Venom, which is the only interesting thing about this movie, takes forever. It's not like the Eddie Brock character is somebody that you want to cheer on. He's a scumbag um, who only in the lib- in the mind of the like the liberal left. The left coast is a guy who's taking on the corporations in the news enough to say he's a good guy. Cheer him. Ugh. Anywho, so yeah, the board, the, the, the whole beginning's terrible. There's no, there's no characters. There's nothing to really get get you interested in this movie. You could have literally cut the entire first half hour. You'd have lost nothing. Then there's the middle, which is only fun because Tom Hardy, like. It's as if he it's as if he listened to my description of Denzel Washington in Training Day where he's just walking around with no pants on smacking his dick into everything and so you know and that's it <laughs> that was how he acted his way through the rehearsals of Training Day and then they were like okay put pants on and go do the same thing It was like Tom Hardy took that to heart and it was like I'm going to do that but <laughs> but I'm not just going to smack my dick into things I'm going to full on have sex with everything around me that was how he acted his way through all the stuff with Venom. You want to talk about a massive lost opportunity to deal with psychosis, to, you know, multiple personalities, voices in your head. There was so much grist for the mill, and instead it got played like, we're, we're going to get to it when we do the Rotten Tomato reviews, but somebody compared this to Steve, to Steve Martin and Lily Tomlin's All of Me. That's about right. <laughs> I, Kyle, I I agree with you about the psychology thing. The only thing I want to add very briefly is that something that Jeff mentioned about this movie that you needed a a David Cronenberg style of like body horror that you know kind of went with like the fly. You need that kind of element to go along with this as well. And you've got a bunch of great material to work with there between you know the physical transformation, the reality of this thing invading your body and the psych and the you know psychosis that goes into it right there was so much good stuff here that yeah. could have been explored exactly and it's like it, it was like i don't know if they cut it from the movie or it was never there to begin with but all of the stuff of tom hardy dealing <sighs> with the symbiote inside of him and the voices and everything else was thrown aside as if to say we don't want to deal too much with this we just got to get to an action sequence so how can we how could like they know they, and it's like they knew it too they knew that there was something there to be played with and shown on screen and they were like how can we do everything i just said but reduce it to 2 minutes i know he'll go on a feeding frenzy and eat tots yeah then he'll eat the garbage and then he'll do his best daryl hannah impression from splash and eat a live lobster and then sit in the tank which had me laughing so hard i oh, I, I couldn't take it. Um, anyway, that's like the best part of the movie. And, you know, there's an elongated action sequence, um, which was fun which and everything. Was, which one was the one you were saying, no, there's what, there's this great action sequence and it kind of saves the movie from being the worst thing all summer. Which one were you referencing? Um, I would tell you the um, the length and breadth of the motorcycle chase. Yeah, I would, uh, the motorcycle chase was a solid. I liked it. Because of the visual effects and everything, and yeah. how they—I mean, after that, how, it was down to shit. Kind of how they kind of weaved everything into the scenery and made it actually look halfway decent, but that was one yeah. of the only saving graces. Like normally, when you see a movie like this, you're like you're just dying for you know you're dying for Robert Downey Jr. to put the fucking Iron Man suit on. You want Spider Man to be in his suit. You want to see the Venom suit. I was happier when they didn't show the Venom suit and they just had the Venom shit flying out of him doing stuff. It looked cooler, and I liked what they did with it. I liked how you know I like how it manipulated his body uh, as a you know uh, as opposed to just kind of being a CGI mess. I'll get to that in a second. Um, so that's the middle, and honestly, it's like the it's like if you just walked in after a half an hour and leave right before the third act. That's it. That's all of the movie you need to see. Just you don't need to see the first or the third act. Let's talk about that third act for a moment, and then I'm going to hand it over to Jason. I've seen rapes that were less forced than that ending. Holy wow. shit! Wow. Okay, 
the the reasoning, and you know it's true, Jason. I just I said what you were thinking, whether you realized it or not. Okay, first of all, you have a villain who changes, who go, who went from I'm trying to save humanity to yeah, sure, I'll join up with the alien symbol and kill everybody on the planet. That's fine. No in between. <laughs> like if, if the no alien... no progression whatsoever. <laughs> just no. snaps on a dime. <laughs> right. Now you have Venom in re- who does who does this in reverse, right? Because his whole thing is we got to get to the spaceship. I have to bring my people down. We have a thing to do. We're aliens from Independence Day, okay? And then in the middle of that, he goes, and eh, maybe not so much. And then when you and then well, but but por qué? But why? Well, I'm a loser because of you, Eddie. <laughs> Wait, I'm a, a, I'm a loser. Let's be losers together. Right, I'm in love with you, Eddie. We're both losers, essentially. Which ha- which was the stupidest thing I've seen in so long. I almost threw something at the screen and left the movie. But it gets even it's worse. The di- it's the dialogue equivalent of Reese Witherspoon turning into romaine lettuce. Like, yeah, it's just that. It's that. Stupid. It's that bad. Um, and and then it gets, but it gets worse. Um, <laughs> it's. Then yeah okay it was it, the two lines sort of follow each other it's in the same bit but it's I'm a loser where I'm from and what changed your mind here's what and here's what kills me about this line not even the line itself okay this is such this is like worse than screenwriting 101 this it's so bad I you know I'm a loser where I'm from too Eddie blah 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 what changed your mind you Eddie cutscene. Are Why you... did he do to change his mind? <laughs> right. The, thank there's, you, Jason, for no calling stuff. out. And, <laughs> thank you, Jason, for calling out in class. But that's my point. There's no follow up to that. There's no explanation. It just just dies on a vine somewhere. And you're like, what did Eddie do to convince the alien to go against his own species? I mean, Eddie's kind of a bag of dicks. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but when was there time just... for anything? Literally, the, 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 the sad success... part about that, Robert, is in the comics. Yeah, he's a bag of dicks, but at least in the comics, he's a redeemable bag of dicks. Yeah, I, I don't want to do, do too much of the comic, but there's Eddie Eddie Brock in the comics isn't like an actual character. In this, it's like again, I, look, looking at it at face value and judging it on its merits, everything that happened up to the point where the alien said, "You convinced me otherwise," Eddie is Eddie. Reacting to be to to uh, someone trying to kill him, then the surgeon gets the symbiote off of him, and that's it. The um, he's then saved by the girlfriend, who's wearing the symbiote for a while, and it has no mental effect on her, by the way, or physical effect. Remember, this thing eats organs, and then jumps back onto him and says, be a "Perfect match." And then, and then jumps off of her back onto him, and that's when he reveals in that everything I just explained: running from being killed, being forcibly separated, somehow convinced this alien that it should turn on its own species and save humanity. I'm feel I, I really do hope that part of the reason he decided to go with this is that the symbiotes reproduce asexually, and having been in both of them, he's hey, if I can hitch a ride. <laughs> so the last thing I, want, I just want to talk about real quick, other than, you know, again, it would have made more sense if Riot had just taken over Elon, evil Elon Musk's body and he no longer existed. It's just It was just a shell. That would have made more sense. For Elon Musk yes. to suddenly decide he's going to turn on humanity too is this the, wor- the absolute ass worst writing I've seen in quite some time. I mean... I said before, this quite isn't quite Leonard Part 6. It Well, some of the writing is about Leonard Part 6 level. It's that bad. It's Bill Cosby shaking butter at a lobster. Butter! If you haven't seen it, Leonard, you should. That's a hilarious Le- scene. Leonard, Leonard Part 6 is a classic. <laughs> um, but let me say this, and then we'll take a deep breath and let Jason take over. That ending... Look, if people who have heard the show before have heard me and, and Robert get into some pretty loud screaming matches over things like CGI. Okay? (laughs) This is probably going to be the first time he and I 100% agree that was the worst CGI fight. Worst CGI I've ever seen in my life. It was essentially two MS paint blobs having, you know, having, having an orgy. 
It was it was just MS Paint Bukaki, and then at the end of it, they stab Eddie. They they stab Tom Hardy, who miraculously is revived by the stupid symbiote after being run through from the back. Yeah, that thing destroyed like all of his major organs. Like he's not he's dead. Like I would have I would have gone along with oh he's bleeding out and the thing can repair the damage because it's right. established that. This thing can repair a lot of uh, some pretty it catastrophic can, damage. It somehow is able to set bones and miraculously, you know, heal bones. Okay, like if it's acting as sort of a cast, and you know, and, and acting as muscle. Sure, I guess. Uh, but, okay, like there's there's degrees I will go to. Uh, I will go along with this because as stupid as it is, he was stabbed I through know the, the spine. Type of movie. He was stabbed in the back through the spine, out the gut. He's not heart, <laughs> lungs. <laughs> Every major blood vessel gone. He's dead. They could not have possibly wasted money on getting a decent screenwriter uh, that they ran out of money to pay the fucking CGI people. I, I, I just I don't understand how a major motion picture by a technology company such as Sony could have put out a garbage product like the ending of that movie. It's fucking awful. It's an insult to motion pictures. Jason Teasley, your fucking witness. Wow. Uh, where to begin on that one? <laughs> um, well, let's let's go ahead and go go down the rabbit hole that I know Robert loves to talk about and that you touched on. The horrible CGI. I know me and Robert's so talked in the in in the past a lot of times, one thing that takes him out of movies is horrible CGI. And ever since that, me and him's had a couple of discussions. He points stuff out. It takes me out of movies as well. So, I've that ruined ending. The current, I've ruined how movies are done for at least one other person. My life is complete. That, that ending was, uh, God, it was a cluster to say the least. Um,. Then there's the whole characterization of Eddie Brock. Um, <clears throat> he, he had no character depth. Uh, he was just there. Um, the Venom character was not... The Venom symbiote was not fleshed out at all. It was... Everything with him and Eddie was extremely rushed. It went from... Suddenly they bond and now they're BFFs... Uh, getting ready to do a uh, remake of Bosom Buddies on NBC. <laughs> um, and, like, they wanted, they forced the love interest. It's, what's what's up with movies? Do they, does every movie need a love interest? Yes, that's actual is, notes from is, producers. It, the, if exactly. you listen to Mark, yes. Because there was, I seen, I'm pretty sure that, um, you guys have more chemistry on the Transformer <laughs> love interest on Transformer reviewing Transformers than these people had on screen. Um, we certainly had more passion. It, oh, that's. I mean, it was it was so forced. Um, and I, I, I love Tom Hardy as you know, like I said earlier, when they announced him being becoming Eddie Brock and Venom. I thought it was a great match, and then I seen it on screen, and I was like, "What is this abomination?" <laughs> I, I mean, the the movie just felt so rushed. It was nothing was really fleshed out, like you said, Mark. It was just people reacting, not actually getting any any depth. Um, they they claim, I think that they said Eddie had a tumor in this one. That the Simi and I was help help keeping him going to help keep him alive or something. When in the comics it's cancer. Uh, but another problem I had was that was when he first gets his, gets Venom and he's escaping and he just runs through the fence and everything and magically goes up a tree. The the Simi, he can manipulate your clothing and your appearance. It's not that hard to camouflage something in a wilderness. Why did I, maybe it's because they didn't have the CGI budget after that fight scene? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, but 
you know, it's that's that's one thing I couldn't understand. And now let's get on to the the whole life foundation. Like I said, I'm pretty sure the security there um, was Barney Fife with one bullet in his gun, and that's about it because not only were they able to hack in and nobody know what happened, Riot manages to infect a, looks like a 10-year-old girl and walk straight into the lab (laughs) and be a perfect match for the girl and suddenly bond with evil Elon Musk without and, and everything is just okay it's just okay that that's believable I, I mean this movie was all over the place it, it had no real direction it was like what can we do to re- retain the right to a Spider-Man property without using Spider-Man Robert your witness <laughs> yeah this thing was just an this was horribly edited. I mean, and I'm, I'd argue the writing's just bad, but it was exacerbated by the editing being so bad. Again, that whole final fight scene is just, it's a, it's a mess. It's a mess of colors. It's incomprehensible almost. At one point, Venom and Eddie get absorbed into Riot and Elon Musk, and it's never explained how or why that happens. <laughs> By the way, my absolute my absolute uh, like favorite line as far as the worst written dialogue I've ever seen in a movie is Venom explaining what Riot is, and he goes, "He's got shit you've never seen." Ugh. This was honestly. This sounds like something my son would have written. He's four and doesn't know the alphabet. <laughs> sounds about right. Um, God. what was it that I had? Um, yeah, I agree with you about, you know, it, it makes more sense if Riot just completely takes over the mind and body of Elon rather than in some form. I I could even, here's the crazy thing, I could even have accepted if they'd given him the logic of, okay, I genuinely believe that the best way forward for our species is if we can find a way to merge, you know, symbiotes and humanity, that what the resulting organism is the most perfect form of life we can create. Let's bring them all here. And I would have gone along with that, but they don't even give you that. It's just, yeah, sure, destroy the planet, kill all the... Like, I don't care. <laughs> it, it, it makes no sense. There's a, and Bear in mind, what I just said, as far as descriptors go, still, to, still isn't actually all that good, but it's something. It's something other than, yeah, sure, alien life form that's now attached to my body whatever you say I'm, I'm willing to go along with this you clearly have our best intentions at heart yeah I mean it was like I said no fleshing of characters out no direction of, of the reason why Elon Musk eth- <laughs> ethnical Elon Musk just changed his mind going from saving the world to destroying it you could have you say- could have a small, a small snippet of there, with Riot just kind of taking, like Mark said earlier, just taking him over, and just being the shell of the person, and then acting out the plan rather than, hey, I just, Riot's bonded with me, and I just want to destroy the world now. Um, I also have to say this about the bit. I mean, I know that. I agree with you guys that the motorcycle chase sequence is probably the best action sequence in the entire movie. I have a real problem with the fact that for some reason they were able to willy-nilly set off dozens of I mean like suicide drones? Like, (laughs) Release the drones! Oh, you want to keep track of them? Are these armed drones? No, they just blow up. Okay. Kamikaze drones. How much does each one of those things cost to make, just incidentally? <laughs> and I... then, they, then, then this is another thing. Um, did you guys notice the th- the quote unquote Easter egg that at the beginning of the movie of the spaceship who they found alive? 
Oh, yeah, it was Jameson. Yeah, and it's like, okay, here's a fanboy callback. And it, it just felt like it was so forced, and it was like... So Robert doesn't know what you're talking about. I do. It's, it's J. Jonah... Yeah, okay. Robert does. Okay. Yeah, J. Jonah Robert... Jameson's son is an astronaut. Right. Yeah. Okay. I didn't know... Okay, so, I, you said you weren't familiar with guys, the Venom character. Guys, 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 please, please, we're clu- we're totally part of the MCU. See, reference to J. Jonah Jameson, and there's a Stan Lee cameo. Take us seriously. Yeah, that that's that's what I was getting at. It was like here we we can be part of the MCU. Everybody has talked about wanting to do Carnage as an Avenger movie. Here we go. Can I just say that's the uh, dumbest thing? <laughs> okay. The, the handling of the Carnage character is the, one of the most inconsistent things in comics because his first major appearance is this epic crossover event that takes a whole team and then like three episodes later the sentry flies him into space and tears him in half. Yeah. <laughs> and, like, and, I, and, and you get the the epic uh, arc that came out this past year of Threat Level Red where he bonds with the Green Goblin. Yeah, uh, Which you can hear them talk about on the Source Material Podcast here on the Rattle Legend Broadcasting Network. Cheap plugs. <laughs> oh, yeah. The cheapest. Um, was there... So, uh, I, I just... I'm willing to suspend a fair amount of disbelief, but... this you know, The setting off of multiple explosions in the middle of downtown San Francisco with drones, whose only purpose is to self-destruct... I, I, is there no police? And the fact, and then you know, twenty minutes later, at a completely different location, an entire SWAT team shows up for no reason, apropos of nothing. <laughs> <laughs> no, just, no police blotter, no nothing. They just they know exactly where he's at, and for no reason uh, like hey marauding SWAT team just happens to encounter bad guy and then I mean then he beats the cra- like, uh, then you know he beats all of them fine I'm okay with that but can I also say that the I feel the PG-13 rating for this was a terrible call yeah yeah it should have been R it should have been a hard R let, let me let I mean, me let me talk about that for a second so by all means so here you have Sony executives who are mucking their way through this film and I think somewhere in the uh, show, in the showing this movie to uh, certain groups oh gosh what are they called again Robert um Focus, focus groups. Focus groups. Thank you. And showing this to the focus bane groups. Of my, one of the banes of my existence, by the way, focus they, groups. They basically lost their nerve and they thought, okay, even though we kept the budget low on this one, we're a little afraid this isn't going to bring the people out like we think it's going to. Let's go ahead and make it PG-13. We're going to get some more kids then. We'll get some more parents. We'll hedge our bet. And if and if we have a runaway hit in our hand, then we can experiment like, you know, like they did with Wolverine and Logan and making it R. But until then, let's do the safe thing. Let's do the Marvel thing. Let's make it PG-13. That's how they got there. And in doing so, they took what was probably not a bad film, something that I wouldn't be screaming and cursing about at this time, and they ruined it. They absolutely chopped the shit out of this thing, gutted the heart of it, and what's left is a mockery of... Uh, of you know, so people have been calling this like a throwback and not a good way to like the 90s Marvel films. They're not entirely wrong. They are not. Right down to the crappy soundtrack. <laughs> Boy, we the were, hard cuts. Venom was such a big guy in the '90s. What's the most '90s thing we can do musically? Eminem. Yes. <laughs> I, I was waiting for like Limp Biscuit and Pearl Jam, and uh, then the show. I, I couldn't. Att- I could not we, have taken that. We, I mean, the music we needed, was bad enough. We needed no shelter by Rage Against the Machine. There be no shelter here. The front line is everywhere. In all, I mean, seriously, the music for this movie is just bad. <laughs> it's just bad. <laughs> like, I can't get into any of it. Yeah, I don't think it really works. Uh, be that, you know, the songs that they remove from popular culture, be that the original stuff, it's just, it doesn't work for me at all. 
Do we, uh, let's uh, see. We've we've we, dumped on the action for being unreadable and you know bad CGI. We've dumped on the acting for being essentially non-existent because the writing was so bad. The characters aren't actually characters. The editing for chopping this thing into an incomprehensible mess with the timeline that's so wildly distorted, it makes it, it just doesn't make any. Again, for some reason, Riot spends six months bumming around Southeast Asia, then just in time for the climax, hops a plane to San Francisco. It's it's completely illogical. This is my question: Is okay the initial the initial crash? He gets in the EMT. He walks. That village must have been a hell of a long way away for him to walk. <laughs> and then he becomes the old lady who, granted, she's probably not as fast as a normal person, but, you know. She you don't even know what the old lady a... does for six months. Yeah, it's like, does she go fishing? Does, is she knitting a sweater? <laughs> she's pulling rice is she what did... she's doing. I mean, if you have no, she's working the rice fields. I don't know. Nobody knows. If you, I feel like if you have, if you wanted to tell that of this character just possessing its way across the world to reunite with the other symbiotes because he's responsible. Like, there's, there is a way to do that, and it, act, it just unfortunately involves. It would have involved more cutaways, but it's going through different places in the world. It like starts. Here, uh, it could have been like the Denzel Washington movie. What was, um, what was that movie? It's an old Denzel Washington movie. It's like kind of a psychotic, psychotic thrill movie where it just passed by touch from person oh, to person. Oh, Fallen. Yeah, is it Fallen? I want to say Fallen. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you could have showed that, and it just like just inserts through the first half of the movie. To see it working its way across, that would have been yeah. sufficient. Yeah, Denzel, uh, John Goodman's in that, if memory serves as well. Yeah, and did it not feel like? I, I mean, this is just me. Uh, I guess it's me as a father now, since I have a, a daughter. Most did it of not time. feel like? Really? Yeah, she's eleven. Um, <laughs> she. Yeah, I don't think I've been. I don't. I, I don't think I've been on here since I've been married. Um, but uh, did it not seem like really creepy that the old lady followed the little girl to the bathroom? I wanted a little bit, but I wanted more creep. Like there's yeah. there's hints of the darkness that should be in this movie, but there's it's no there's better no. Better if it was a guy going into a Target bathroom, then there could have <laughs> been a then there could have been like you know justification. This is why this that should not happen. Samianites can infect your little girls. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I think the thing yeah, I again, hate... There, there were some parts that could have been very creepy that sadly didn't actually get played appropriately. Like there, there's, there's hints of darkness that should be in this character because in case you were... Uh, for those unfamiliar, Venom's a violent character. He eats people. They turned it into a joke for this movie, but that's a thing. Yeah, but that's the thing. Like, they needed a, this movie needed to be like two and a half hours, and an hour just spent with Tom Hardy and the, and the Venom symbiote. He needed there there needed to be preferably in some kind of institution. Well, okay, no, I, 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 I don't. You don't need to do it. In, look, you needed an hour of of um, almost like Eddie Brock, like not having any control over the thing. You know, it, like it doesn't know how to control it yet. So Venom's fully in control. And instead of you know, and instead of doing the stupid eating thing, it needed to be um, him actually like running around. Like the, the, they were they were supposed to be copping from Lethal Protector. Now the, the actual Lethal Protector storyline would not have made a good movie, but the a whole concept behind Lethal it, Protector it is doesn't make a good comic book. <laughs> um, the comic book would not have made a good movie. But the idea behind Lethal Protector was here you have this hero, um, like the Punisher, essentially, who, you know, who's a vigilante and he's running around killing bad guys. And that's what, and if you're going to do it because the reason Venom is killing people is it needs to, is it needs to feed, 
because it's you know it's been in this lab for so long it hasn't fed or anything like that like you could have written a reasonable explanation for why it's decided to murder humans then that needed to happen that venom needed to go on a killing spree that's at least somewhat guided by Eddie Brock's conscience, you know, as it's you know, like he doesn't know, Venom doesn't know the difference. But, you know, if, if if they can like moderately steer him in the beginning to just like killing muggers and shit like that. And then Eddie wakes up. He's got just just drenched in all this blood, you know, from Ven- you know, from Venom's, you know, wild night out and him having to, you know, deal and him having to deal with the, his conscience, it's like, I'm a murderer. You know, this, the struggle between him and Venom should have been real. I, and I, I hate to say it that way because it sounds like I'm making fun of it. But it, that, that should have been the movie. Instead, the movie is I said, like, the, like the Ghost Rider with Nicolas Cage. Not the fun one where, he, uh-huh. where, where it was shot like it was on meth. Uh, Spirit of Vengeance that at least had a that at least had a directorial style, which if you're on meth is even better. But um, no, I've never done meth. <laughs> yeah, uh, have you ever? Yeah, me neither. Have you ever done? Have you have you ever seen the movie Speed? Ven- Spirit of Vengeance, same movie, yeah. uh, only with Ghost Rider. Um, but never okay. done, never done meth either, guys. But the but the point <laughs> you I find no no no. no. I'm not sure about that, Mark. <laughs> yeah, um, you, you, you know it's how long it took him to, to dispute that. <laughs> um, only my pee test will know. Anyway, but the point... Do you get what I'm saying, though? Like, there should have been an entire hour of Venom, uh, of Venom and Brock wrestling for control and something happening to them and realizing, you know, neither one can have full control over the body. They have to share. They have to be a unit. They got to that point way too quickly and for no good reason in in this yeah. movie. Yeah. That's my biggest complaint. Because I can live with shitty CGI, and I can live with shitty underwritten um, characters that aren't the main character. But if your main character fails, essentially this movie was one pillar. The pillar that has to work and hold the whole thing up is the relationship between Eddie and Venom. And if that's not working, your whole film falls apart. And that is the story of this movie. Well, I mean, even if they'd done the whole um, where Eddie was exposing people on the newscast and not all of a sudden those people ended up dying and, you know, Eddie's getting the blame because Eddie exposed them and you made the correlation there, it would have been some kind of... A bridge there to show that that you know they got to work together, like you were saying. But it was just like the the relationship needed to be more fleshed out because it went from bonding with him to all of a sudden you have the the fight in his apartment, and then you know next thing you know they're on a buddy cop comedy um, and, and they're like having these like it's like playful banner back betw- back and forth It's the relationship was way too rushed you needed that struggle and this movie could have been a lot darker and it needed to be but they tried to keep it light and funny and it, it could have been so much darker and gritty and you should have just got Chris Nolan to do it, and we would have been <laughs> saved. Not for nothing, but like you know, the, the theater that I was in was packed, and people were laughing. But they were laughing at like the stuff, you know, the, the, like Venom calling him a pussy and things like that. It's like, mm. you know, it's like four people, <laughs> literally four people in the theater when I saw that. Nope, I saw I, well, I saw uh, like a seven o'clock showing on a Friday night. It was a packed house. And sure, because well, everyone on a Saturday night. I mean, one of the things about this movie is you know they're going to crow about their opening week, which is big, but it was always going to be good. I'm if I'm Sony, I'm significantly more worried about hey, what happens next week? Well, because thankfully. it's not going to be good. Well, again, if, if if you're Sony, you're like, well, thank God, there's not much. Uh, I mean, there's First Man. Uh, bad times at the El Royale, and then something else, which no one's going to go see. Um, Doesn't matter. This thing's dropping like a rock. All right. Well, with that said, is everyone satisfied? Have we all kind of blown our load here? Can we move on? 
the movie sucks. I'm in all in all honesty, like I pitched to Mark to try and save myself from this atrocity. How about we just wait until they release the extended director's cut and we'll just review that. I don't I don't even have any interest in that anymore after this. <laughs> like there is this was this was over... commentary over No, no. I I want nothing to I do made with that this suggestion character. he said no. So I said, "Well, then do your job." I I want nothing to do with this character. I don't want this character anywhere near anything else. This was just not good. And unfortunately, because people are stupid, they didn't wait to see if it was good before, you know, giving it $200 million. And with that said, here come the money. Here comes the money. Here we go. Money talk. Here comes the money. Money, 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 money. <laughs> Dollar, dollar. Dollar, dollar. All right, as Robert just indicated... Uh, on a budget of 100 to 116 million, uh, as of today, it stands at 215 million. Uh, it's only a matter of time before Sony. Let, let let me say this: it's only a matter of time before Sony greenlights a sequel. But look to Fox and what they're doing with Dark Phoenix, New Mutants, and T. He Gambit, uh, because that's pretty much going to be the model that Sony's going to use, which is act like you're still a movie studio. Wait to be bought by Disney, and then who cares? That it's did only. Did you see the uh, I, random question, like related to this loosely? Did you see the trailer for Dark Phoenix in front of this? Because I did. Uh, I not did. in front. Not in front of this. Uh, no. See, yeah, I didn't see it. In front that of this. is just the dumbest looking thing. <laughs> I, I mean, I've I, seen the, I've seen the, I've seen the trailer, and it looks horrible. But <laughs> yeah, I've oh, seen, this I've was see... actually the first time I saw the trailer for that movie, and I went. Are we seriously rehashing the worst way to do this character? That I mean, it's like, hey, you know what? X Men: The Last Stand really wasn't that bad. Let's try it again, <laughs> and we're not going to change anything except the cast. All right, let's and make her young. Let, <laughs> there'll be plenty of time to bash Dark Phoenix next February. I mean, next June. I mean, uh, November. I mean, twenty twenty. <laughs> um. The, the the amazing moving Dark Phoenix movie that keeps fucking up my schedule. All right. So Venom How was... Many, the, it, 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 hang on. It, on a serious note, you've had that thing on the... I mean, we're going to review it if it comes out because you hate me. Uh-huh. But you've moved... That thing has had that thing has had its release date moved, what, four times? It started... Uh, it, stop, 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 stop. I, I know the answer to this. It started <laughs> November of this year. It then got moved to February. It's now, I believe, June. <laughs> Which, by the way, oh. I haven't told you. I haven't. I haven't. I haven't revealed the news. But you follow the schedule. You like. You ha- You you can see it. I don't know if you got the alert. But uh, Battle Angel moved off its date in December into into what was once Dark Phoenix's date in February, and then Feb- and then Dark Phoenix moved to June. So guess what we're reviewing in February now? Ugh. <laughs> yeah, buddy. I I had ho- I was hopeful because like when it got moved. I was like, oh, I won't have to review it because much as I love Christoph Waltz, I just I watched that movie and went the trailers went watching this will make my eyes bleed. I can't do it. But now you must. But now now I kinda have to again. Unless something something better. Move to move your release date to February to that same one in February, please. Please don't. I can't I'm so tired of rearranging my twenty nineteen schedule. Um which is pretty much all filled out except for Metal Hammer of Dooms because fucking record companies don't tell you anything early enough like movie studios do. Anywho. They'll tell you everything and then just change it 40 times. Yeah, probably. Um, my contention is, though, within the next five years, Sony, Sony will sell off its movie division to Disney. And none of this will matter because all of the Marvel properties outside of the Hulk will, uh, will be back under Marvel's banner. Which, in case you're wondering what I mean by that... Universal still has distribution rights for the Hulk and some subsequent characters, including Namor the Submariner, for some strange reason. Moving on, Venom was the number one and, and movie no of one the will weekend. No one care because the Hulk sucks. So does your mom. Um, a Star Is Born, featuring Lady Gaga and all of her fans. This this is what I want to talk about real quick. So, <laughs> so in theory, the story goes like this: 
Lady Gaga fans were spamming like Rotten Tomatoes, like the, the fan review sites and t- Twitter and whatnot to try to bring down the the Venom uh, the Venom uh, rating score. And basically try to tank the movie so that A Star is Born would be the number one movie of the weekend and make all the money. Uh, well, that didn't happen. <laughs> the week, it, it, Venom made twice as much as A Star is Born. I, I don't know if any of that's true. You know, there's been, there's been different theories that it's actually DC fans posing as Lady Gaga fans, which if it is, that's hilarious. Um, either way... Like get lives, people. I don't know what to tell you. Let, let, let me let me point this out as having an ex fiance that made me attend a Lady Gaga concert. Um, no, their fans are her fans are flipping crazy, okay. and it would not surprise me because it's like they are a brainwashed cult <laughs> that thinks. Uh, I'm I'm not joking. I mean, I seen some stuff in Pittsburgh over that weekend that would. Would make you blush, Mark. Um, oh, I mean, it's I, well, Pittsburgh. Once again, Sorry I say there. people get lives. Um, so anyway, I mean, it, was, it was crazy. In all seriousness, this movie doesn't need help being trashed. Like, <laughs> no, this, this isn't like the Last Jedi, where there was where I mean, there's people who legitimately don't like it, which is fine. They're coherent. I disagree with them, but they are coherent. And then there were just like you know the Russian trolls who were just like, no, no, this movie, man. Let's drop it. it, it this will be hilarious. We need to... You know what the world needs? What? A, a solution to global warming? No. We need to take down Star Wars. Get lives, people. Get lives. It, th- this movie does not need help. This no. was... Ju- I mean, not in that respect. Like, it's just not good. It's right. genuinely not good. I need to get through the money here. Where It's going to be It's gonna be midnight before the stupid podcast is over. We've literally talked about Venom longer than any movie, I think, this year so far. Um, and that includes Reese Witherspoon turning into lettuce. So, A Star is Born debuted at number two. Smallfoot, which my kids saw, and my wife described as liberal propaganda. Make of that what you will. Uh, <laughs> fell, from, <laughs> fell from two to three. I Night- love your wife. <laughs> Thanks, so do I. Uh, Night School fell from one to four. Uh, the House with a Clock in Its Walls, three to five. A Simple Favor, four to six. The Nun, five to seven. Crazy Rich Asians fell one spot from seven to eight. Hellfest, I'm still not going to see it, Ronnie Adams, fell from six to nine. And The Predator, it, Mark. nope, uh, fell from eight to ten. White Boy Rick, nine to eleven. Free Solo, not a Star Wars movie, fell from 24 to 13. To 12, rose from 24 to 12, excuse me. And finally, The Hate You Give, yeah, buddy, uh, debuted at number 13 and made a hot $512,000. Ye gad. Oh, look, Christopher Robbins uh, um, uh, made money this weekend $435,000. Good for them. All right, uh, so here's where we stand for the year so far. Nothing has changed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Guess what? Avengers, still number one. Um, <laughs> nothing's even close. Uh, yeah, your top four movies are still... <laughs> are can still I guess st- that Black Panther's still number two? You certainly can, Ollie, and you would be correct. Jurassic World is still number three. Incredibles is still number four. Mission Impossible has gotten all the way to five, uh, and it's still making money, oddly enough. Deadpool 2 is resting at a comfortable six. Ant-Man the Wasp has risen to number seven. Good for Marvel. Uh, Ready Player One fell from uh, its once high point of five to now eight. Uh, Operation Red Sea, which is a Chinese Chinaman movie, as is Detective Chinatown, fell out your last two spots of nine and ten. Uh, yeah, nothing from the last week or so, or the next week, is going to threaten any of those. Uh, the Meg, sitting at number 11 with $525 million. Sony's best movie so far, not counting Venom, or counting it, depending on how you look at things. Hotel Transylvania 3 with $513 million. Then Rampage, then Solo, then Mamma Mia, then Fifty Shades, then Monster Hunt, then Peter Rabbit. What time is Peter Rabbit? Then The Nun, which is rising up the charts. And finally, A Quiet Place at number 20. For those wondering what happened to some of the movies that were once in the top 10, um, well, let's see. Sky- Skyscraper's at 21. Ocean's 8 is at 22. Pacific Rim, 23. Tomb Raider 25. Uh, Venom sits comfortably between Crazy Rich Asians at 27 and The Equalizer 2 at 29. 
and uh, Disney, poor Disney's Christopher Robin. <laughs> um, I don't remember what the budget is for this, but I don't think it's quite made its, its budget back yet. It's sitting at one hundred and eighty million dollars. Poor, poor Christopher Robin. It's getting Robin. closer. I have um, to double check what it was specifically, but are you ready to laugh, Robert? Usually. All right. Well, I hope I know you're having a bad night, so I hope this makes you feel better. A Wrinkle in Time has made more money than The Predator. <laughs> they both suck so much. <laughs> By a cool nine million uh, nine million dollars. Hey, boy, that Predator franchise reboot they were planning. Boy, that was such a good idea. Yeah. Almost as good an idea as putting giant Oprah Winfrey as one of the leads in your movie. Like, who thinks these are good ideas? Who gets so, paid for this crap? So, you know, let's talk about where Ven- where we think Venom is finally going to sit. Next, uh, this weekend, it's, um, it's competition. is Bad Times at the El Royale, which I think people will go see, but not enough that I think it bites into Venom. Uh, First Man, I think, is Oscar bait, but no one's going to go see it. Um, except for people who are really into astronauts. And then I think I, I, the movie that's going to be the number one movie of the weekend, and it's because it's a kid's movie, uh, it's Goosebumps 2 Haunted Halloween. I think that, um, I said before, it's like, oh, some third movie that no one's going to go see. Yeah, I take that back. Everyone's gonna, Everyone who's a kid and their parents are going to go see Goosebumps. That's going to be your number one movie. That's going to be the thing that uh, I think bites into Venom. But uh, I, I'm I'm pretty. I mean, at 215 million, I figure it's going to be about 350 by the time it finally dies. The weekend after that is the Halloween soft reboot by Universal. Uh, it's the in continuity sequel to the very very first Halloween movie. Um, I figure that'll be the number one movie of its weekend, and by that point, no one will be seeing Venom anymore. Following Halloween is nothing. It's Hunter Killer, Indivisible, Johnny English Strikes Again. So Halloween will be the number one movie of that weekend. And then we're into uh, Bohemian Rhapsody, Nobody's Fool, and The Nutcracker in the Four Realms. And by that point, nobody will be seeing anything from the month of October. Any issues with any of that, Robert? No, I I think 350 is slightly optimistic, but 300 and change, yeah. Yeah, three hundred and fifty being like the, being the high end, um, three hundred being the low. Jason, you wanted—I I don't know if discussing the money of motion pictures is a thing you do, but that's what we do here. You want to weigh in here, or are you like get on with it, you nerds? I'm good. I, I just—I'm just enjoying the the show. <laughs> you've walked—you've walked off the panel. You're uh, you're in the audience now. I'm down the audience taking fielding trying to field questions. Okay. Do you have any questions? No. Terrific. Not about money. Okay. Unless Robert wants to do unless Robert wants to actually cover the Halloween reboot, I'm I'm good. Oh, we're covering the Halloween reboot. Yeah, we're, I I I I told Robert every year oh, I will on. see I will see Mark, at least one Mark horror movie. Marcus wanna see a horror movie? I am. Mark is actually seeing a horror movie. I am. Every Halloween, I promised I would see one, at least one horror movie wow. that was in the theaters. Last year... Wow. Uh, oh, no, I didn't go see it, did I? <laughs> you were supposed to, but then you, you, know, you, you conjured a hurricane to get out of seeing that movie. <laughs> I don't know Black Magic. I don't know what you're talking about. What horror, what sure horror movie don't. did I watch last year for you? Uh, in what, 17? Yeah. Shh. Give me a second, then. Let me see. Well, it wasn't it. I mean, it was supposed to be, but... I'm really curious. What uh, is, let's what? see. I don't know. I don't think you did. Because we saw right. we saw Blade Runner. We saw Thor Ragnarok. God help us. All right, hang on. I'm looking, uh, at, my, I'm looking at my October 2017 calendar here. Oh, we did Jigsaw. Ugh. That's right. I saw Jigsaw for you. You're welcome. Jigsaw wasn't bad. I yes, it was. It, was. it was. It wasn't bad. It I was mean, bad. it was. It um, wasn't as bad as some of the, some God, of the other ones. So. Ghost of October's past. We had an on trial for Ballistic X versus Seven. Damn you, Hollywood for Blade Runner Two. Uh, we did a TV party for Voltron. Did a damn you, Hollywood for Geostorm. That piece of shit. And then, uh, and then, yeah, then there was Jigsaw. 
See, I'm honoring my I'm honoring my uh, my commitment to you to see one horror movie per October. You're welcome. Yeah, I'm just saying, next year it's it chapter two, and you better have watched the first one by then. I will. I will make. Sure, I'm intending on it. Um, there's no horror movies next year for, in the month of October if you don't count the Joker, which I don't really know the motif they're Only, going for there. It, it, look. It's only going to be horror in the sense that it's going to be horrible. Um, October, yeah, it's quite, uh, October next year is looking like this. Abominable, Joker, Jungle Cruise, Zombieland 2, and a TV party tonight for Constantine. So, no. Zombieland 2, I, I, I might sign up for. Okay, well. Hey, Zombieland 1 was really good. Yeah, Zombieland 1 was great. Yeah, there's like no... Let's see how uh, these sequels do like 10 years after the original... <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if uh, if this is going to change. God knows, but um, I'm looking at October. There's like really no good horror movies in the month of October in 2019. All right, I know as much as I know, everyone loves the rattle and schedule cast. Let's get on with this. Um, All righty, folks. <clears throat> Robert Winfrey, Jason Teasley. I have a question yeah. for you. Okay, I have a question. Is a cue not to talk? Got it. Got it. Don't talk. Tell I have a question. Uh, what's your question? <laughs> no, I'm just trying to get you to not talk. Oh, for fuck's sake. All right, Robert Winfrey and Jason Teasley, <clears throat> I have a question for you. Are you ready? No! I said... No, God, please, no, 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 no. All right, ladies and gents, here we go. Uh, Kyle Wilson of the Nerd Repository. Venom isn't the home run Sony was hoping for, and it certainly isn't the film longtime fans have been craving. But the good news is that Hardy is really fun in the role. I think we all agree with that. I I wouldn't go with really fun, but... I mean, somebody that sounds like they write for a paper called the Suppository. I mean, yeah, good, good <laughs> Rep- job. Rep- repository, sir. R- repository. Um, suppository. All right. Uh, Sean Collier of the Pittsburgh Magazine, speaking of Pittsburgh. The best thing I can say for Venom is that it's so ridiculous that it's worth watching as a train wreck. No. It's not. Like, they're entertaining train wrecks. <laughs> this isn't one of them. Yeah, that's, uh, that's like insulting the train wrecks. It really is, because there, there are some entertaining train wrecks. Yeah. Cat Hughes of the Hollywood News. Not as, spa- not as bad as Spider-Man 3. Venom sadly fails to capitalize on its potential. There's high hopes for a sequel, although with an opening that this lackluster, Sony might just hit the reset button once more. Look... I know we all like to dump on Spider-Man 3 because it's kind of a mess. It's not this bad. Uh, saying that, oh, well, it's better than that. I'm not so sure it is. And I believe me, Spider-Man 3 sucks. I don't especially oh, care for any so of the cool. Sam Raimi Spider-Man movies, in all honesty. Just Spider-Man 2 was good. Oh, Spider-Man 2, 2 was like the good. high watermark for, for uh, other than like the Dark yeah. Knight for comic book movies. Meg... I completely disagree. All right. Meg Downey of CBR. It's never boring. But it certainly doesn't yes. hold... <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> well, she, she, tire... must, she must have been in the line <laughs> to get popcorn for the fo- whole first act. Do You guys didn't even make it through the whole comment. Let's try again. It's never boring, but it certainly doesn't hold up under close inspection, and it definitely doesn't meet the standards by set by its genre predecessors. It is boring. Like just for straight up, the first thirty to forty minutes is boring. There's just nothing. Just, uh, how can you say oh, it's not? Bo- it's never boring if you nap through the first half. Then saying maybe that's, saying that's not boring is like me listening to my ADA. ADHD daughter try to explain her day at school and me paying attention. That that's more interesting than the first thirty minutes of this movie. 
Uh, let's see. Problem is, I agree with a lot of these. So find ones that are just stupid. I'm trying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying. Congratulations. Okay. We found I, the one hang on. so bad and divorced from I found it. Of, po- of politics that people agree with that we can't actually do this bit. So, okay. I actually found a comment that's so stupid. It, I found the one that I think is going to give you a, is going to give you a stroke, and we might have to okay. end the bit on this one unless I can find that line about um, about all of me. Ben Coleman of The Stranger, Seattle, Washington. Venom is the Catwoman of toxic masculinity. It's bad. Oh, for the love of God! <laughs> Here we go. Ah, I think day. I just had, I think I just had an aneurysm. <laughs> Whoa, whoa, okay, first of all, yeah, this is almost as bad as Catwoman. Like, it's ba- this is a bad movie. I told you, Catwoman is a masterpiece. We've had... I, Mark, I, I we, are not, we are You're not going. doing this. <laughs> not doing it. Okay? I will not have you and trolling you claim, about you, Catwoman. And you claim you haven't done math. <laughs> okay, I suffered, Mark. I saw that movie. I suffered. I will not have you make light of my suffering. I don't know how you arrive at toxic masculinity related to this movie. <laughs> I just don't. Like, what What about this struck you as falling within that vein? Like, oh, the main character's a man. Like, that's, it. Like, that's all I've got. The, the, the 30 seconds with she venom. <laughs> that's what caused that comment. Ugh. We we can't have, you know, a man talking to another ostensibly male extraterrestrial entity and have this be anything less than that like, uh, I know I know what the problem is. So There's the, and I made fun of this before because I did the bit with you whether you realized it or not, but at one point the symbiote calls uh Tom Hardy a pussy. That's toxic True. masculinity. Oh, shut up. <laughs> men men if you it, Men who speak, congratulations! You're contributing to toxic masculinity. He's like, get out of here. I mean, it would have been better if he caught him a douche canoe, but <laughs> that's very true. You should work in punch up, uh, Jason Teasley, Johnny Alexinski, uh, Sinski of the New York Post, top critic. Okay, top critic, Jason Teasley, like this guy, one of the best in his field. Are you ready? Venom. Venom. More like cyanide. Sorry. <laughs> you actually wrote how that line. Get, how, how does it, that's almost as bad as them forcefully putting in the you're a loser, I'm a loser, let's be BFFs. That's oh, almost no. as bad as my stupid stand up bit about hey, you know, he's, you know, because Venom well, is, uh, again, Venom's a I thing, wasn't... Venom's a noun. Whereas, you know, Havoc and Phage and Riot and Carnage are all adjectives. And because he's Robert, out, he's the one, he's left out of the, he's left out in the cold. Robert, I have respect for you, so I wasn't going to, you know, bring that up again. So, you know. No, no it's okay. okay. Like, it amused me, but I know how dumb it is. <laughs> but, I mean, I, 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 I'm, I feel, I feel dumber listening to that comment. Yes. Well, we I I've had that experience with these things Mark chooses multiple times. It does actively drain your intelligence. This Dana, movie is as bad as Woody Harrelson's wig. <laughs> Dana Barbudo of the Patriot Ledger. Venom is a hot train wreck, and by hot I mean Tom Hardy in the lead role. Arr, arr. You cannot look away even though the movie is a disaster. I'm pretty sure that was really Mark Radley's um, <laughs> review, and he just stuck somebody else's name on it. I, I I don't find Tom Hardy to be attractive. Sorry, he's not my cup of tea. Now Tom Cruise. Arr, now we're talking. So you like midgets? That's, that's par for course. Be, Mark has to be the bigger man in the relationship. Goddamn right. right. Power bottom. There you go. Why he I mean, and I can't, right. It's why he and I could never be together. Because I'm six feet tall and he's five and a half. You're also a buzzkill, man. Whatever. Whippers <laughs> a ray of sunshine to your life. Vena, uh, Damien Straker of Impulse Gamer. 
Venom is terrible and the worst film of Tom Hardy's varied career. Hmm. I, um, I don't know. I had to look at the filmography. Hang on. No, no. I've seen a lot of Tom Hardy movies. Let me think. I, I have to. That's... I mean... I mean, I actually enjoyed Child 44 because just watching him and Gary Oldman together, that's also not a very good movie, though. Um, he was in a really, really kind of crappy horror movie early in his career. Um, I forget what it was called. But even that had some atmosphere going for it. The one where he plays the famous criminal brothers is... I know You're it kind of fell flat for a lot of people, but I rather enjoyed it. Lawless um, was kind of a mess, but I don't think it was bad. Locke is actually really good. Dunkirk's good. Uh, Black Hawk Down was good. Bronson is incredible. Yeah, yeah. Okay, whoa, whoa. He was in, I forgot he was star, he was in uh, Star Trek Nemesis, so okay. It's kind of a Sucker that's kind Punch. Of a Sucker Punch wasn't. Yeah. He was in Sucker Punch. Yeah, he played different Rodders. Movie, different movie, not the. This was a different yeah, movie than the. Uh, the yeah. Zack Rock Snyder. and Roller. Rock, Rock and Roller. Okay, yeah. Again, it's like between this and Star Trek Nemesis as the worst films of his career, but that's a fair observation. I haven't, from what I've seen, at least, there's a few that I haven't. All right, two more, and then we're done. Roger Moore, Rob's uh, spiritual father uh. of Movie Nation. So this is why Sony keeps remaking and rebooting Spider-Man. They haven't a clue how to make Venom work on the big screen. All right, we're just gonna. I just, I just needed to read Rob's dad. Uh, but here's the one I want to end with, and then we're done. Alonzo uh, Duralde of the Rap, top critic, and he really does get the line of the fucking night here. If you replaced Tom Hardy for Steve Martin in All of Me and switched out Lily Tomlin for a wad of chewed up black licorice, you'd have Venom. Yeah, which is relatively accurate. <laughs> uh, no argument here. <laughs> uh, all right, folks, that wraps up our trashing of this movie. Um, I believe as far as the schedule goes, uh, if you get more of me and Rob next week though we're not reviewing a movie we'll actually be review- reviewing Hannibal season 2 which I'm two episodes into um, uh-huh. episode 3 now uh, we'll also be doing an extra TV party tonight on Thursday October 18th it'll be myself Sean Garmer uh, possibly some other folk uh, this came out of our Power Glove review we're going to be reviewing the first four episodes which consist of season 1 of Castlevania uh, as brought to you by the good people at Netflix. Oh, good I was series. so annoyed that was only four, I was so pissed that was only four episodes because it's it's yeah. really good. Uh, it's the, really, fo- really good. <laughs> the following week, a damn you Hollywood will be back. We'll be looking at the new Halloween movie, and then again another Thursday TV party tonight. This time it'll be Daredevil season three, and finally. Uh, that's it for me and Robert for the month of October, but uh, the hits keep on coming. We've got an on trial for Halloween 2, the 1981 feature, and a TV party tonight extra commentary for Spaced Invaders on November 1st, as brought to you by Justin Thomas, as we celebrate the anniversary of the War of the Worlds broadcast. Plus all the Metal Hammer of Dooms and source materials and all the news that's fit to print here in the Rattle Legend Broadcasting Network. Jason Teasley, tell the good people where they can find you these days. Uh, well, usually you can find me sitting on my ass in my new house, but uh, every Wednesday you can check out W2M Network, uh, where I'm part of the four-person panel on the kickoff, and eventually the resurrection of Fantasy Football to the Max will be coming as soon as I can get Brandon Biscoby to actually keep a schedule. Outside of that, I don't do anything. <laughs> All right. All right, Robert, take us home. All right. You can find me most Sundays on the 411 Ground and Pound radio show. This week we look back at UFC 229. Got to warn everyone who listens to it about the first 30 minutes or so. It it rambles more than I'd like, and I apologize for that, but I also don't edit these things, so you get what we record live. I Again, sometimes it's great, sometimes it 
take some work. I apologize for that. But we talk about the brouhaha between Khabib Nurmagomedov and Conor McGregor's corner. We talk about the actual fight, which was a thorough drubbing on the part of Khabib, who just put a beating on McGregor. We talk about the rest of that card. Tony Ferguson's back, and uh, uh, horribly happy about that because Tony's awesome. Crazy as a loon, but awesome. Uh, we talk about some of the major news items that have broke over the last week. We trash what was then thought to be the main event for UFC 230 and that whole situation. Uh, now it's come out that Der- uh, Daniel Cormier will fight Derek Lewis, despite Daniel Cormier having a hand injury and Derek Lewis technically being suspended by the Nevada State Athletic Commission past the date of UFC 230. Uh, Derek Lewis has no chance in hell of winning that fight. He's going to get taken down. He's going to get abused by Cormier. I mean, Daniel Cormier is the daddest man on the planet, and we must all respect the dad that is Daniel Cormier. Uh, I just want Cormier to re-injure himself during this fight and push the Lesnar confrontation back another six months because I would find it hilarious, and I, I enjoy the chaos. So you can listen to, anyway, all of our takes on that, major news that comes out of that event and whatnot. Uh we're off for a couple of weeks because the UFC put everything into UFC 230 or 29 and nothing for another couple of weeks and even then it's a really bad event it's a really bad event Um, but in a couple of weeks we'll be back to preview it so you can find me there Mark and I will talk Hannibal which will be fun because I love that show and uh, the, the grossness is ramping up and Mark is struggling to cope with it Oh god, it gets more gross than the guy pulling himself out of the uh out of the human eye thing. Yes. Yuck. Okay, well, I'm going to get through it because I love you, Robert Winfrey. Love you like a brother, so I will suffer for, I will suffer like no man has suffered before so that uh, you know, we can do this podcast. <laughs> and on that note, but uh, for the record, yes, there is significantly weirder stuff ahead of you. Yuck. Okay, well, whatever. It is what it is. I can always look away if I can't deal with it. All right. It's, uh, good to have Jason Teasley back in the show. You're welcome back at any time. Just uh, let me know when you want to jump onto something, and we'll have you on, Jason. I'm glad to be back, and I, I love doing another show with you guys. I always enjoy coming back and where I got my start and playing homage to you, too. Absolutely. Well, like I said, uh, if there's something that tickles your, ball, it tickles your sack... We'll be uh, happy to have you on. <laughs> All right. Speaking of tickled sacks, uh, for Robert Winfrey, for Jason Teasley, I'm your mandated reporter, and frankly, I'm mortified. This has been Damn You Hollywood. Be well, be safe, and behave. insurance and we'll help you find options that fit your budget here's some music to get you pumped i hear your budget laughing at you oh wait that's just those kids laughing at me ignore them progressive casualty insurance company and affiliates price and coverage match limited by state law